Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Today, let's continue with our study of uh, the book of Galatians, a verse-by-verse -verse commentary. Beginning with chapter 3, verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Hmm. O oh, foolish Galatians. Well, Jesus said, don't call anybody a fool. And Paul is calling the members of the Galatians, uh, Galatia church, uh, fools. Um, and what other way can you describe them? Uh, uh, isn't it foolish? Isn't it absolutely crazy to receive the good news that salvation is a free gift? You don't have to do anything uh, to, to receive the gift except trust Jesus completely. Put all your faith in Jesus, believing that He's already paid for all your sins, so God's not angry with you. God will embrace you, and all you've got to do is rely on Jesus for your salvation, and it's guaranteed because Jesus promises you if you'll just trust him completely, you're going to go to heaven. I mean, that is really good news. Could you imagine after hearing that from the Apostle Paul, and then the Judaizers come into Paul's churches and say, Paul's a false apostle. You can't be saved by faith alone. You got to get circumcised. You got to follow the dietary laws. You better go to the temple and you better do your animal sacrifices. You better follow all the laws of Moses and keep your fingers crossed hoping you've done well enough. So salvation is a formula of faith in Jesus plus practice Judaism perfectly. Uh, so uh, for a person to be converted from free gift theology to faith plus Judaism, faith plus works, how foolish is that? Well, let's look at this in the Amplified translation, verse 1. Oh, you foolish and thoughtless and superficial Galatians, who has bewitched you that you would act like this? To whom, right before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified in the gospel message. On to verse 2 in the KJV, it says, This only what I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. So Paul says, did, did you receive the Holy Spirit by working, by following the law, by practicing Judaism? Or did you receive it by faith in Jesus? Um, I'm sure Paul made it very clear to them. The, the true good news. And yet, they've been bewitched. They've, uh, they've departed the faith and embraced religion instead. Um, verse 2 in the Amplified says, This is all I want to ask of you. Did you receive the Holy Spirit as the result of obeying the requirements of the law? Or was it the result of hearing the message of salvation and with faith believing it? Um, it is mind-boggling, but this kind of thing not only happened at that particular time and that particular place, but it, it's happened throughout all of church history and it happens today. How many people do you know who... Uh, they believed and they got saved, and yet they get uh, uh, persuaded by false teachers that uh, 
Well, believing in Jesus is important, but that's not enough. Uh, you've got to do your part. Uh, you've got to make yourself acceptable to God. You've got to repent of your sins. You've got to get sin out of your life. You've got to do a lot of good deeds. And uh, only by having faith in Jesus and a lot of good works will, uh, will you possibly uh, receive salvation. Um, it happens all the time. Uh, I would say that 90% of all professing Christians today believe that salvation is a formula. We ask, we believe in Jesus. We believe uh, he is the Son of God. We believe that he died for our sins. We believe he rose from the dead bodily. Uh, but do you believe that you're going to go to heaven for that reason alone? Because of what Jesus did for you? Because of what Jesus promised you? If you would just trust him, you get to go to heaven. Or do you believe that, you know, uh, you got to get that part right, but you better, that's not enough. Uh, get water baptized, or in these days, get circumcised. Uh, you better uh, get sin out of your life and, and uh, start doing good deeds. In those days, you better follow all the laws of Moses. Uh, so regardless of where, whether it's uh, uh, imposing Judaism on a believer or whether it's impos imposing lordship salvation, uh, it's, it's still the same problem in that when you add any other requirements and you've spoiled it, you've nullified it, fight it, you frustrate it, you've made Christ's death of none effect. There is no value. There is no saving power in a faith plus works uh, belief system. Uh, verse 3 in the KJV, Are ye so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? So that was really what the the argument was, okay, yes, you, you, you need to believe in Jesus, uh, but if you want to have perfect your faith, uh, then you've got to add works. And uh, um, really, that's what, uh, if, if we go back to the um, uh, 11 years after Pentecost is when the uh, Peter was confronted by James and the Jerusalem church over the uh, Gentiles um, joining the church. Uh, when Peter was sent to Cornelius's house and, and God told him that nothing's unclean, and uh, Peter learned then that the dietary laws of Judaism no longer apply. Uh, when God told Peter to go into the home of Cornelius and he was told that nothing is unclean and Peter realized that uh, Gentiles are not uh, unclean and uh, we don't have to be segregated from them. We can uh, have fellowship with them as uh, brethren, believe, fellow believers in Christ. Um, so when that happened, um, and Peter gave his account to James in the Jerusalem church, the initial reaction uh, was was not favorable. Only with Peter uh, strongly standing up for uh, his uh, faithfulness to God's command on him. He, God's the one that told him to go into the Gentiles' home. God's the one that told him that uh, dietary law is no longer applicable. God's the one that told him to associate with Gentiles. Uh, and and uh, so Peter declared that he was going to listen to God, not James or the Jerusalem church or any other apostles. And uh, uh, But James and the Jerusalem church, they said that, uh, well, good, 
believe in Jesus, but you've got to also practice Judaism. And then they finally ended up saying, well, um, if they if they want to perfect their faith, then um, this would this happened in 20 years after Pentecost at the uh, Jerusalem Council, when when Paul went and, and took uh, um, can't remember if it was Silas or Barnabas, but he, they they went to Jerusalem and had this council. At that time, the problem still persisted, and Paul wanted to confront James and the Jerusalem church over the fact that the Judaizers were going around saying you can't be saved by faith alone. You can't be saved unless you're circumcised. So they went to uh, have this council, this meeting, and uh, straighten all that out. But at that time, you can't see anything in Acts chapter 15 that, that will tell you that James, in his decree, uh, was said, well, no, you don't really have to be circumcised. You don't have to practice Judaism at all. No, he, he simply said, okay, we're not going to bother the Gentiles with that. But because every city has a synagogue, and at the synagogue, they teach you about Moses and the law and how to practice Judaism. So uh, James is saying, all of that is available for the Gentiles. If they have a care enough that they want to perfect their faith, then they can go to the synagogue and uh, learn about Judaism and convert to Judaism and practice Judaism uh, after they put their faith in Jesus. And then in believing in Jesus and then practicing Judaism, then their faith will be perfect, perfected. Uh, that was really what the decree was. And I believe that uh, what well, you can't find anywhere in Acts chapter 15 where James actually said, well, it's true that circumcision is not required. He doesn't say that. He just says, let's not bother with that. And that is because James and the Jerusalem church they they really even 20 years after pentecost they're still at the point where they really don't believe that they should be associating with gentiles they don't believe that uh, um, um, gentiles are really important it's really still a mindset where they're focused on the jews and Jews becoming believers in Jesus. And uh, that's why they basically, they came to the conclusion is, okay, Paul, you go spend all your time with the Gentiles. Well, why would they send Paul to, to take talk to the Gentiles? Because they didn't really care about the Gentiles. They said, go. basically, they're thinking, if you want to waste your time associating with Gentiles, go ahead. Well, we won't bother the Gentiles with anything. Um, and, but Peter and John and James, we're, we're gonna, we'll have the uh, ministry uh, for the circumcision for the Jewish people. That's who we're going to focus on. So the decision was made that the Jerusalem Church, their priority, their really their sole focus would be the Jews, uh, and, and they were just happy to get rid of Paul and send him off to go kind of waste his time dealing with these Gentiles. Um, the, the, there was never a decree that, well, Jew or Gentile, uh, circumcision is not really a requirement for salvation. No, that, is, that was never stated in Acts chapter 15. Uh, so let me see this is... Uh, So that when it says, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? And that is the question. That why, why would Paul say, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? It's because if you read the book of James, if you look at, if you look at uh, uh, Acts uh, chapter, I think chapter 11, when, when James makes the initial decree uh, to uh, Peter regarding the new uh, Gentile believers, that uh, uh, 
it, it really, the whole point is, the whole belief system is that faith in Jesus, but if you really want to perfect your faith, you've got to also practice Judaism. Otherwise, your, your faith will be imperfect. Um, let's read that in the Amplified, see how it phrases it. Verse 3, are you so foolish and senseless? Having begun your new life by faith with the Spirit, are you now being perfected and reaching spiritual maturity by the flesh, that is, by your own works and efforts to keep the law? Well, why, would, why would Paul ask that question? He asked the question is because that is what the Galatian church was being taught after Paul left. The Judaizers came in, and that's what they were taught. That uh, are, are you are now being perfected and reaching spiritual maturity by the flesh, by your own works, by your own efforts to keep the law. That's what the Judaizers were teaching. That's what James and the Jer Jerusalem church were teaching. That's the reason Paul asked the question. Do you really believe what the Judaizers are telling you? Or are you going to believe what you were taught in the beginning? That salvation is a free gift by grace alone, only because God is being gracious to us. By faith alone, that means faith is the only thing that is required and no religious work is required at all. If you add any religious works, then your faith is nullified. Your salvation is nullified because it must be 100% faith. And, and then the faith must be in Jesus. Jesus is the focal point. Jesus is the object of our faith, the person and the finished work and the promises of salvation of Jesus Christ. That's what we have our faith in. But the reason the question is asked by Paul should be obvious if you'll think, and that is that he asked the question because he's contrasting what he taught them versus what the Judaizers are teaching them. And the Judaizers are who? They're men from Judea. They're men from Jerusalem. They're men from James. That's what the Jerusalem church was teaching. That's what they believed from the beginning. And uh, uh, let's go back to KJV and uh, verse 4. Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? Uh, let's read that in the Amplified. Uh, have you suffered so many things and experienced so much uh, all for nothing, if indeed it was all for nothing? Uh, I think that he's probably referring to the persecution that, that came uh, along with uh, their faith in Jesus. Uh, it was a persecuted uh, uh, sect uh, that, uh, um, so he's saying, look, you've, because you put your faith in Jesus, you've you've suffered. There have been some consequences, and you you were willing to to, to suffer for your faith. But uh, it was all that for nothing, ne because you no longer believe the truth. Verse five in the KJV says, "He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit." and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And the Amplified it praises it. So then, does he who supplies you with his marvelous Holy Spirit and works miracles among you, of course, he, in this case, is referring to God himself, um, and works miracles among you, do it as a result of the works of the law, which you perform. In other words, are all these miracles being done because God is rewarding you for your good works or because you believe confidently in the message which you heard with faith? And back to the KJV in verse 6, even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. So Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. 
So when did Abraham believe when God promised him that, hey, you have been chosen to be the means of me bringing salvation into the world. You will become a great nation, and from your descendants, the world will be blessed. In other words, the Savior and salvation will come from one of your offspring. And Jesus, of course, his lineage is traced to Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Jesse, David, Jesus. This is the lineage that the scripture says that the Savior would come from that particular lineage. So because Jesus believed God when God made him the promise, that faith was what sanctified Abraham. He was set apart. He was declared as holy and righteous and saved because he believed God. And it was a pretty outlandish thing for, let's say, if you heard a voice, or I don't know if Abraham had a visual interaction with Jesus or God the Father. I don't know if there was some kind of theophany experience, but God did communicate with Abraham this promise. And a person could dismiss it as, well, this is just a hallucination, or this is a dream, or my imagination, or maybe I ate some bad food, and whatever. But no, Abraham took it seriously, and he believed God. He believed him so much, he was packed up his family and moved, and was willing to move across the world, wherever God led him into to this promised land. Um, verse seven, no, let me read verse six in the Amplified. It says, just as Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, as conformity to God's will and purpose, so it is with you also. And verse seven in the KJV, know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. So since Abraham, every person who's had their faith, uh, the right faith, uh, the, the faith that Abraham had is different than the faith that I have because not as much information was revealed to Abraham. But the amount of information, the amount of knowledge that God revealed to Abraham and then gradually through the prophets and through the, the scriptures and uh, before and after Jesus, uh, we learned more and more about God's plan and all the particular details. And so now our faith is, is more complete as far as understanding and uh, what God's plan and promises are. Now we know that this uh, blessing that would come to the world through Abraham's seed, that that is, uh, uh, that is a person named Jesus of Nazareth, uh, Jesus Christ, Jesus God manifest in the flesh, the Son of God. We know who he is. And we know also know the means by which he accomplished our salvation, that he, he died on the cross and paid for our sins. So the death on the cross as payment for our sins is what makes it possible for us to be reconciled with God. Uh, because now God no longer holds sin against us. Jesus paid for the sins of the whole world, uh, for the believers and uh, also for the whole world. Um, so now we know that uh, who this savior is, we know the means by which he accomplished our salvation. And we also know that he raised himself bodily from the dead to give us a sign or a proof that all his claims are true so that our faith in Jesus is justified because uh, we have the resurrection as, as the proof. Um, 
But that's uh, all the people who are of the faith are children of Abraham. All the people who are of the faith are children of God. Verse 8 in the KJV. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Okay, so I guess I jumped ahead with my thoughts. Uh, let me read verse 8 in the Amplified. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, proclaimed the good news of the Savior to Abraham in advance with this promise, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. Uh, verse 9 in the KJV. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So, uh, if someone is under the law, in other words, if someone believes the law is the right way to get saved, that we need to follow the law and uh, then you're under a curse because it says you have to do the law perfectly. From your first breath until your last breath, you cannot have a single violation. In word, thought, or deed, you can never err. Uh, one mistake means you failed. And so, since that's impossible, the only one that could do it is Jesus. And because he accomplished it, we get credited with his righteousness and as believers. But the people who are trying to establish their own righteousness uh, by following the law themselves and trying to attain, attain righteousness and uh, peace with God on their own, uh, then they're under uh, a curse because what they're attempting to do is really impossible. Uh, let's look at verse 10 in the Amplified, for all who depend on the law, that is, seeking justification and salvation by obedience to the law and the observance of rituals, are under a curse. For it is written, cursed, that is, condemned to destruction, is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law, so as to practice them. Verse 11 in the KJV says, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. So when God looks at us, he either sees us as uh, having on the wedding garment uh, or not having on the garment. And when God sees you with the garment, he says, okay, I'm choosing you and you. I'm choosing all the people who have the wedding garment. That white robe is symbolic of the uh, righteousness of Christ that uh, has been imputed to us. We're covered in his righteousness, and that's what God sees. So it says... Uh, no man is justified by law in the sight of God. No, when God looks at us, he's not looking and seeing, uh, uh, oh, um, you follow the law so perfectly that you have your own righteousness. No, that's not possible. It's said that you're, if you try to get righteousness by following the law, then you're cursed because it's impossible to follow it. So if, if you want to be justified in God's sight, he had to be justified by having the righteousness of Jesus. So if Jesus, if God sees you with the wedding garment, then he says, I'll choose you and you and you. He's, yes, God chooses, but he chooses based on the criteria of, do you have the wedding garment on or not? If you don't have, if you have it on, come on in. If you don't have it on, shut the door. Uh, verse 12 in the KJV, and the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. And let's look at 12 in the Amplified. But the law does not rest on or require faith. It has nothing to do with faith, 
But instead, the law says, he who practices them, the things prescribed by the law, shall live by them instead of faith. So you're, you've got to decide. You can't have a combination of faith and works. It can't be mixed. When you try to mix them, it nullifies them. It, it's no longer law. It's no longer faith. It, it, you, but you can be, you, you are guaranteed that you'll be justified by faith if you put it entirely in Jesus. But can you be justified by the law? Well, you're welcome to try. But uh, don't think that you can mix law and faith. So you, if you choose law, then uh, you've got to do it perfectly. And uh, you're not able to do that. No one can able to do that except Jesus. So therefore, you're uh, doomed to failure. Um, verse 13 in the KJV, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. So the curse of the law is if you're trying to be justified in establishing your own righteousness by following laws, uh, whether it's the laws of Moses or whether it's uh, the, uh, the, the law of your conscience or whether it's the, uh, um, the golden rule, uh, it, it, whatever it, it is, uh, you can't do it perfectly. So Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. In other words, we don't have to be under this curse because we can choose to put our faith in Jesus instead of putting faith in our own ability to establish righteousness. Being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So let's look at that in the Amplified, verse 13. Christ purchased our freedom and redeemed us from the curse of the law and its condemnation by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs or is crucified on a tree or a cross. Verse 14 in the KJV, that the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law. Uh, he became uh, a curse for us by hanging on the tree, by being crucified, uh, so that the blessing of Abraham could be given to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, so that we could receive the promise of the Spirit, that the Holy Spirit would live in us, regenerate us, um, trans. Uh, bring us to life spiritually and seal us with the Spirit so that uh, our, our future is guaranteed and it is irrevocable, irreversible. We're going to go to heaven. We're going to have eternal life. No matter what happens, neither God has the ability to revoke it and man does not have the ability to undo it either by his sinful life or by his loss of faith. Man cannot undo this new birth. Uh, so verse 14 in the Amplified, in order that, that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might also come to the Gentiles so that we would all receive the realization of the promise of the Holy Spirit through faith. Now, uh, beginning with the next verse, uh, the subtitle in the Amplified is Intent of the Law. So this is a good point to, to break because uh, the next verse, the, the kind of the subject will be changed a little bit. Um, so we'll end this here and pick up with chapter three, verse 15 next time. Okay, well, I look forward to your thoughts and your comments. Uh, thank you for watching, and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God.
Jesus.